We've seen neoclassicism before. A few weeks ago, we looked at Oedipus explaining the enigma of the Sphinx, which was a painting by the, the predominant leader of the neoclassicist movement, after Jacques-Louis David, and that was Jean-Auguste Dominique Angra, and Angra was actually a student of David. But this week, we're going to be looking at a painting by David, entitled The Death of Socrates. Socrates was a philosopher who lived in Athens in ancient Greece, and I'm sure that you've heard of him, obviously. Everyone has. But in case you're not familiar with the story, he was condemned for atheism, or at least not believing in the gods that were recognized by the Athenians, and for corrupting the youth of Athens. Back in ancient Greece, and really the ancient world in general, you had uh, people who were assumed authority figures. And if you've ever read any um, of the Socratic dialogues, which were written by Plato, Socrates himself never really produced much uh, literature on his philosophy. You'll see an example of how uh, Socrates kind of developed this questioning method, which today we refer to as the Socratic method, where he would ask someone questions to reveal their ignorance. Um, with the intention of eventually arising at some sort of a universal truth. So in the Euthyphro, um, he challenges a priest or a religious figure of some sort on what the nature of piety is and how we can distinguish between what is pious and impious. And ultimately, this religious figure who claims to have supreme authority and knowledge over what's pious and what's impious isn't able to reach an acceptable definition. And those were the kinds of things that annoyed the Athenian noblemen. They didn't like Socrates making them look like idiots. And obviously, a lot of the, the younger people did like that because they liked, you know, these teenagers. They liked seeing these authority figures uh, belittled by this, this nobody. Socrates was not, he was well, he was well known throughout Athens, but he wasn't, he wasn't wealthy. He wasn't really an influential person at all. So the, the Athenian youth, they liked seeing these, uh, these leaders uh, be made look like idiots by Socrates. Of course, the leaders themselves didn't like it, and that ultimately resulted in Socrates' trial, which is recounted in a different Socratic dialogue uh, entitled The Apology. And in The Apology, Socrates tries to defend himself um, against these charges of atheism and corrupting the Athenian youth. Ultimately, he's convicted, although the interesting thing is uh, he actually wasn't convicted. Uh, it was by a, a very large majority. It was actually a, quite a narrow vote. But then, as was the tradition in ancient Greece, once you were convicted, you could suggest a punishment for yourself that you thought was appropriate. And, uh, like I said, the, the vote was, was fairly narrow, so the, uh, the kind of the punishment that was originally intended would, was that Socrates would be exiled from Athens and he wouldn't be allowed to return. But uh, Socrates, being sort of arrogant, <laughs> uh, Socrates suggested that his punishment should be free meals. They didn't find that that funny, actually, and then when the sentence came back for uh, what Socrates' conviction was, actually more people voted to have him executed than had originally voted to convict him in the first place. So you can see how Socrates obviously had, uh, had ticked some people off, even though he was, uh, as I said, uh, very influential and very well liked by the, the youth of Athens and also a lot of uh, famous wealthy Athenians as well, like Plato, obviously, who was, as I said, Socrates' student and recorded most of his uh, philosophical concepts in works like uh, the, uh, the Socratic Dialogues, like Euthyphro, Apology, and then Crito. And Crito is actually in this painting as well. He's the, the figure in the front there with his hand resting on Socrates' knees. Plato is sitting at the foot of Socrates' bed, kind of uh, with his head turned down. And Socrates, of course, is sitting on the bed. You can see his arm pointed up toward heaven, sort of suggesting his defiance of authority and his uh, overall comfort with what's happened to him. And then you can see everyone else is e extremely distressed. The, uh, the disciple there who's handing Socrates a cup filled with hemlock. And we always hear about, you know, poison hemlock and Socrates died uh, from ingesting this hemlock. And that was the way that they executed people back in ancient Greece is they would, they would give them this drink and they would essentially kill themselves. Um, hemlock is actually a flowering plant. Here's what it looks like, just so you know. And it's the extract from this that's extremely poisonous. It acts as a neurotoxin. Socrates was married. He actually had children. And supposedly, although I can't actually discern this from this picture, um, supposedly Socrates' wife is actually heading up the stairway out of the dungeon here. And David is kind of an interesting person. As I said, he was really the founder of neoclassicism. 
But for him, art was always an exercise in moral integrity. And these pictures, they're neoclassical, but they're not just neoclassical in subject. They're also neoclassical in the message that they have. This particular painting was painted in 1787. And you have to ask yourself, well, what was happening around this time? And David was in France, and of course, well, around this time, this was leading right up to the beginnings of the French Revolution. So David painted these pictures of uh, heroic instances where, where people like Socrates, you know, kind of the paragon of, of doing what's just, of doing what's pious and mor morally and ethically correct. He wanted to say, look, you know, these people have upheld these values even in the face of death. Now we're faced with, you know, injustice in government. We're being abused by the authority figures in our society, and we, we need to stand up to that. We need to do what's ethically and morally necessary, even if we, in, in doing so, risk death or, you know, putting our lives in danger. And he calls to attention someone like Socrates, who, even in the face of death, was still brave. His defiance, how he's pointing, how he continues to talk, even right before he drinks the hemlock. You can see how David has portrayed him. He's strong, even in his old age, and even in the few minutes leading right up to his death. And, of course, a lot of the values that were... Uh, manifested then in the French Revolution, had also been heavily influential in the American Revolution as well. And in fact, even Thomas Jefferson was present at the unveiling of this painting and was a, a huge admirer of David.